If you haven't figured it out already, our uh, meditation and our worship this morning revolves around work, <coughs> labor. <coughs> and uh, my reading this morning comes from the book of Acts. And I'm looking uh, at the new uh, Revised Standard, and it's verses uh, Acts 22, uh, 20, 32 to 35. Let's listen to what Paul says about work and labor in one of the places. He talks about it a lot. <coughs> and now I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, a message that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. You know for yourselves that I worked with my own hands to support myself and my companions. In all this, I have given you an example that by such work, we must support the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, for he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Here ends our, God, our reading. Thanks be to God. Remember kindergarten? I know <laughs> John just gave me the nod. That's a good thing, son. All right. I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. I've been working on the railroad just to pass the time away. <laughs> Excellent. Working nine to five. Then we moved to Dolly Parton. We have been singing and complaining or talking about work all of our lives, even when you were in kindergarten, but you just didn't know it. And so because of that, I say to you, grace and peace to you this day from God our Father. We have commonly come to think of this time as the last weekend of summer, the final hurrah. Some people now have already started school already, so it's not like the last hurrah before they go back to school, but there are some, like my nephew, who is looking forward to starting a brand new middle school as a middle schooler in sixth grade. And to be honest, yesterday I had a conversation uh, with my young gentleman, and he has a little trepidation in his heart. <clears throat> and when I asked him, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me sharing this with you, when I asked him, Charlie, what's the, the, the thing that kind of worries you most? He said something that I said, and I wonder if all of you have said it in your life. When you went into a new school and you had a locker, and he said, Aunt Kath, I'm most concerned, I'm most concerned about getting my locker open. <laughs> and I had the grace not to laugh, but was able to say, that was my concern too. Anybody else out there? Yes. Yeah, okay, sure. You don't want to look silly or be the last kid while everybody's going by you looking like this. And, and you're going, tch, tch, tch. <laughs> yeah. So being the mom that she is, uh, my niece, this was my great nephew, my niece took him into the school, it was open and the teachers were there, and let him practice. Spot on there, mom. Absolutely. Yeah. And so we have schoolwork and homework. We have workouts, right? We use work in so many ways 
that it seems like we work all the time. And so this weekend has come to be known by many as a final hurrah, yes, but think of it also as a transition time, a transition back to a new opening of returning to work for some, returning to school, returning, starting over again. So Labor Day is not such an all bad public holiday. Well, this morning before you get back to your celebrating, which is a great weekend to do, I invite you to consider with me work as a spiritual activity. Uh, to consider that work or labor, as it's called often in scripture, is a spiritual activity that takes time, definitely, energy, knowledge, and wisdom, and most importantly, that God ordained that work was good. Remember in Genesis chapter 1, God tells us something that he did every day. God worked for us. And he called that creativity. He created the world, right? But the interesting thing, if you look at every verse after each time period that he created earth, land, sea, sky, stars, moon, man, woman, all of the things he created, after each thing, do you remember what it says in scripture? And God called it Yeah, and that, my friends, is where we begin our meditation on the theology of work. Now, I think most of the world, and perhaps some of us, says, well, yeah, after the fall in the garden, then, you know, God said we had to work till we were sweating to death what people kind of remember and lift up most. You know, yeah, it's because of those, whatever your theological beliefs around creation are, you end up somewhere in there saying, yeah, and God got kind of cheesed off at us, and so we got to work. Mm -hmm. Yes, you could interpret it that way, I suppose. But I want to refocus you first this morning, and then I'm going to back that up down, down the road with the fact that work came before the turmoil, and the trial, and the sin. <laughs> God created work, and he called it? So why wouldn't he want you to do that? Think about that. All right. Here we are. The other thing that it says in the first chapter of Genesis is besides ordaining that work is pretty important to him, and that he worked, and that he created, and that everything on land, sea, and sky was pre-planned by God, point number one this morning for us is this. It says in Genesis that God stepped back when he was done creating, and yes, besides resting, which he also ordains as good, as he stepped back, he looked at his work, he thought about what he did, he perhaps evaluated all of that, and then he called it good. So I'm wondering, no matter whether you're retired, whether you're in kindergarten ready to go into first grade, whether you're going into middle school for the first time, whether you're doing high school as a senior, almost like the last hurrah there and moving on, I wonder how many times we do our work and we move on. And we don't step back, look at what we did, evaluate it, and say, God, I think that's pretty good. Don't miss the fact that God wants you, as Andy read this morning, 
in Ecclesiastes to say, I can rest some, I can recoup, and then I can proceed on to do perhaps a little more or a better job, or, and I can even, as Andy read, enjoy it. See, um, how many of us have yourself, you yourself, or perhaps your kids or grandkids who are working, and particularly if people have been in the job 10 years or more and they feel stuck, that they are afraid to not show up and work, and anybody, family member, or what, it's, it's a common thing, right? Um, I can use my brother as the case. He worked for the Michigan State Highway Department for 30 years, you know? And there were times that he enjoyed that. Um, and there were times I can remember that he would say to everybody, oh, brother, can't wait, can't wait till I get out. Anybody else have kids or family or you yourself was like, I'm doing the best I can, but boy, oh boy, retirement is coming, right? And that was that, that, that <laughs> raise your hand, Jeannie Hebner, yes, indeed, okay? And how many days, no, you don't have the days, right? Okay, but you have the season counted, don't you, kiddo? June 5th, June 5th she has the date. June 5th, uh, our Jeannie gets to retire from being a gift to school kids, absolutely. And it's not that she doesn't like, speak for, speak for yourself, girl. I have the best job in the world. That wasn't prompted, because you know Jeannie now, right? She would say, no, I didn't have a good time, Ro. Yeah, yeah, she had the best job in the world. And that's God's will, you see? That's what God wishes for all of you. Now, I'm looking at a bunch of faces out there that look a little bit retired, or maybe just tired. I can't really tell this morning. And that's the world. See, now, we've we got to be careful here. That's the world, isn't it? Because for us in that generation, don't listen, Jack, it's not, you know, it's going to be way different, but, whoa, I can't imagine what it's going to be like when you get there. You know, and I, you know, and you aren't going to be one of those people that are like 30 and out. Remember all of the sayings I have them written down that I have heard in my career. Um, boy, I would, wouldn't mind uh, 30 years, but that's all I can do, and then I'm out. All right? Um, I can't wait till 62. We have magic numbers, isn't that true, that we set before us? 62, and I can retire early. Um, well, there's more, uh, that you don't really work, get, you'll love this one, Jackson, that you don't really start work until you're um, age 16 or over, and then you get a work permit. I think you've been, how long have you been building the house? Never mind, I'm not going to ask. <laughs> Too long, yeah, that's right, okay. Um, here it is, I, you know, I looked in scripture extensively, and nowhere did I find we shall labor 30 years until we reach age 62, and then we can enter paradise on earth. Um, there's nowhere in scripture that it says you can retire early from work and enjoy life. Um, there's nowhere that it says you need a work permit to start either. Interesting, because that's the culture speaking to you. Go back to Genesis God said, work can be enjoyable, work can be good. How many people, just random survey, how many of you guys really enjoyed what you did? Look, go ahead and look around. Yes. You know what I want to, I want to break this to you? That is not the normal world. Particularly the normal world of our age. Um, young people now, we went through a period in our cultural history that people were working just to provide. And you know what? Particularly in our community, don't you think that there are a lot of young families and a lot of who's double, double people working, mom and dad both working jobs and raising four kids or three kids. Why? Because they have to. 
And you know, if you feel like it is they have to, it doesn't help your attitude of enjoyment or passion. It's a little hard to work up passion for something you feel you have to do. Agreed? Yeah, yeah. So don't think that because we all can raise our hands, I'm included and say, every bit of work God seemed to ordain me to do, I thoroughly not didn't just enjoy, but had a passion for, you know? Um, reminding you that some of you, I hope, woke up in the morning, you know, remembered and acknowledged God for getting your eyes open, and when you went out, you went, I wonder what's going to happen today, let's go. That's God-ordained work. But let's get outside our bubble just a minute, our own little bubble here, and think about all of the people that get up in the morning and say, oh, I wish I didn't have to work today. And that leads me to my second point of there is a different connotation between secular and spiritual. All right? And... Secular work is, for many, I've got to do the laundry. <laughs> I've got to clean the house. Not just I've got to go to my place of employment. Um, how many people think that it's kind of work to cut the lawn? <laughs> Jim, Jimmy, thank you. Yeah, Andy, all right, I'm, I'm, look, yeah, I'm waiting. I was going to sit on that a minute, you know, because if no hands went up, I would have been going, seriously? You know, I like to ride the mower too, but when I'm on the fifth acre, <clears throat> oh, I'm on, I'm on streaming. I love you, Elsie. And Elsie says to me, the stripes don't look quite straight. <laughs> I can't, I, I'm transparent though I am, I can't say that I'm overjoyed with passion to cut the lawn. See what I'm saying? So grass, you know, falls into one of those work things. Yeah, I'm going to work. I'm going to cut the lawn. Uh, you wait to get you, the laundry basket rises, and it rises a little more, and you think, man, I better get to that before it, you know, whatever. And at that point, is that my passion? Seriously? Yeah. You get it. Okay, and so what happens then is we get the great, we start and begin the great divide between secular work, which is all that household stuff, you know. For some people, <clears throat> taking the dog out is work. I don't understand it because, you know, I don't understand that. But yeah, for some people, you know, particularly if it's like one of the tasks in the household, you know. Johnny, take the dog out for a while. Really? It becomes work. That's the secular idea. But uh, let me catch up to you here. Um, it's Paul. Hang on. In a nutshell, here's our theology of work, and it comes from uh, 1 Corinthians 10.31. And we jump now to New Testament, and we go to Paul. Uh, Paul basically tells us that the secular includes all of our time. Each day, each month, each year, Paul told the church at Corinth this, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Baboom! He probably didn't say baboom. I'm going to run that one again because, you know, a theology doesn't have to be an entire book with a commentary. Here's some biblical theology of work. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all, there it is, to the glory of God. If we really did that, our lives would be mostly joy, and even when the trials and the mundane and the labor comes, we would be better able to cope and have the attitude of going through it 
with some joy in our heart, not because we love physically expending our energy, but because God ordains that all work is good, and if he thinks it's good, I can find the right attitude in there someplace to smile or at least to breathe and not be cheesed off about it. There it is. In a nutshell, that's the theology of God's work. In our reading from Acts 20 today that I read, Paul uses himself, did you hear that? As an example, as he tells the Corinthians that everything they need to know about their work ethic, their labor here on earth, is contained in this phrase, this verse. Basically, I'm going to paraphrase this one. Now I commit you to God, to the word of his grace, <clears throat> excuse me, which can be built up and can build you up. It can give you an inheritance. God will give you the reward. God has more than you could ever imagine waiting for you. And if you could remember that while you're rowing the boat of life. Right? And now the, the humor stops. I get it. I understand. I don't understand each of your situations about rowing a boat and moving on, even when you really don't want to. I can't know the specifics. God does. God really does know exactly where you're at and what is going to happen to you as you labor on here. And you've got to know that no matter what happens or what wrong turn or river you embark on in your boat, you will end up because you know, you believe, you love, and you ask him, you will end up in a better place of non-retirement than you ever imagined. You've got to smile about that. And when the hard part is owning it, gang, isn't the hard part owning the fact that you really have nothing to do with your life, really, but try to align yourself with God's good work ethic, you know? Um, and work, maybe, volunteering to help us on a committee. That's work, but it's good work. Volunteering to sing in the choir. Now, we get the benefit of you guys, you know. And I hope, and my guess is you don't think of what you do as work, right? But God thinks of it as work because there's no separation, you know. And there it is. And doing the laundry, believe it or not, God ordains that as labor, you know. So instead of opening up the machine and going, ah, you know, okay, I see a bunch of dirty socks over there. Throw it in the bucket and put it in the machine. And push the button. And walk away. And here, I'll own this one, and I do. I don't know why it's a little, you know me, I'm quirky, right? Okay, when I put it all in there, and I, I, I like putting the liquid soap in, and I put the soap in. When I shut the lid and I push the button, I go, thank you, God, for helping me get that done. I really do. It's like, because if it wasn't for you, you know, I'd probably have laundry like this. You know, I, you know, I have to look at it as, as all, all things are to the glory of God. Okay? <sighs> Paul tells us and them that he hasn't coveted anyone else's stuff. He hasn't, and this is what he tells the church at Corinth, I haven't looked for silver and gold or worked for that. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, he worked, he told us, to provide for himself. And I don't think that in Paul's time 
he built a yacht that served and sleeps 26 people, like was on Mackinac Island a couple weekends ago. I, I don't think that was what his aim was. He labored to care for himself, and then scripture tells us, and his disciple, his other people. He was working for the good of all. There it is. And the work of others through how he worked. Verse 35 says this, in everything I did, it's like a personal narrative of Paul, in everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remember the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give it away than to receive. And when Paul finished speaking, he knelt down and prayed with them all. My friends, on this Labor Day weekend of celebration of rest, I invite you to remember that God ordained both things. God, the Father, was the model for all things, including your labor and your rest. And he said, this is the pattern that should, not would, but should continue for you until you draw your last breath. That you work for the glory of him in all you do, including mundane things of the world, including things that help others through your worship and your help and your servanthood. And then, yes, as Andy read in Ecclesiastic, Ecclesiastes, it is good to rest and eat and drink and restore so that what? So that you can do it all over again. And as Paul said, I prayed with them. I invite you to pray with me. Lord God, you tell us our work and our labor matters to you in all we do. God, that our work should be everything we do as glory to you, that through our attitude about laboring, all we do is a reflection of how we worship you, that we can find not drudgery, but true joy, passion, fulfillment, satisfaction in everything we do. God, help us make this so. Give us joy in helping others. Joy as we work hard in our relationships. Joy in doing ordinary tasks for someone other than ourselves. Work is an act of worship. Work is a task of glory. Work is a godly, important part of our spiritual lives. So I say to you, this day, my friends, in Jesus' name, labor on. Amen.